Good evening, Hope Nation, and welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, this evening, I'm just going to start you off with a uh, song that um, commemorates what our Savior did for us so many years ago. So if you know it, please, please feel free to join in with me. The blood that Jesus shed for me. That gives me strength from day to day. Yeah. It will never, never lose. It will never lose its power. Oh, and it reaches to the high. thank Ashley Ardwan for leading us in song tonight. As we prepare for tonight's worship service, um, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who was lifted high up on the cross and died so that he could draw the whole world unto himself, Lord. Grant that we, as we walk through this journey of the seven last word, will remember the sacrifice that was uh, given for us, God. And Lord, as we press forward, let us make sure that as we move forward on this journey that we will remember and reflect and that we will know that we, are, we were loved then and that we are loved now by the sacrifice that was given for us. Right now, as we prepare for the seven last words, I want to introduce to you those persons who will be coming up to give us the seven last words. It will be Kedra Carmichael, Minister Curry, Minister Glenn Reeves, Minister Butler, Deidre Miller, Reverend Jammer, and Minister Ivor Robinson. Let us go to God as we start the seven last words. Good evening. After being mocked, beaten, and nailed to a cross, Jesus takes the time to look past his hurt and pain into the souls of his persecutors and makes this compassionate plea to the Father on their behalf. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Luke 23 and 34. Saints, I'd like to tell you that I'm able to be just like Jesus and look my betrayers in the face and forgive. However, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that I'm not always able to forgive. In fact, as I stand here before you, I am struggling with forgiveness right now. You see, by the time I was 13, I lost count of how many times I was violated, abused, mistreated, and abandoned. I had been molested by both men, women, family, and friends. While some of the hurt I experienced was at the hands of others, most of my pain came from my own actions. For sometimes the hardest person to forgive is you. So I'd like to title this message, When You Are Not Yet Ready to Forgive. When You Are Not Yet Ready to Forgive. Have you been there, broken, hurt, alone, and no matter how hard you try to find forgiveness in your heart, you just couldn't. I believe we all have struggled with forgiveness at some point in our lives. Maybe someone betrayed you, 
lied on you, or even worse, let someone else mistreat you and they sat back and watched. Maybe you too were molested, raped, or violated. No matter what has happened in the past or present, you have the choice to forgive. You hold the power of forgiveness. You see, forgiveness doesn't condone the behavior of others or neither does it minimize the pain that you went through. In fact, forgiveness doesn't even depend on the actions of others. I know, I know, they don't deserve your forgiveness, do they? You didn't deserve how they treated you, the pain, the embarrassment, and the shame they caused. They were supposed to be with you to the end, but they ended up leaving you abandoned. Can you imagine if we did this same thing with Jesus? I mean, what if we treated Jesus that way? Say that we love him, but when others come around, we don't claim him? <laughs> Hurt him with abuse and mistreatment of one another? Or even worse, when he needs us the most, we abandon him. Would we deserve his grace, mercy, and forgiveness? For the word says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But our God is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in love. He is faithful and just, keeping his covenant to a thousand generations. You see, we all are broken. We all are hurting and undeserving of a God that would love us so much to send his son to die for us. So are you still not yet ready to forgive? Then how can we expect our father to forgive us when we won't forgive? What would it look like for the kingdom of God if his children actually started displaying his characteristics? If we not only said that we were Christian, but actually walked as Christ. If we began to love, show mercy, and forgive as Christ. Can you see the burdens lifted, the yokes broken, and the anger and bitterness from our hearts disappear? I believe that Christ wants to release us from the bondage, torment, and prison of unforgiveness but we have to be willing to make the choice. A choice to walk in freedom and allow our hearts to heal. Jesus made his choice while yet dying on the cross. He humbly submitted to the will of the Father and paid the ultimate price for you and for me. He didn't deserve it, he didn't ask for it, and yet he didn't change it. Now it's our turn to make a choice to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Amen? Amen. Good evening, Hope Nation. Pastor First Lady Eastland, Thank you again for giving me an opportunity to bring a message of hope to the congregation on Good Friday. I appreciate your trusting me in this 2020 year of social distancing and our fight against the coronavirus, COVID-19. Hope Nation, my heart and prayers go out to you as we deal with this pandemic. I miss you. By now, you thank you could appreciate having a hug from anyone else. May God continue to be with you. Don't continue to live life without completing your purpose. Don't be a purposeless purpose person. I'm quoting Pastor Kadisha Jenkins. God gave us life for his purpose, which is to do his will. Jesus completed his purpose. Let us pray. Lord, give me clarity of speech. Help me with my pronunciation that I will say each word precisely as it's intended to sound. I don't want anyone that hears not to understand what is said, amen. Nevertheless, let's get to the message that I have prepared. Luke 23, 43, from the NIV title, I promise you, I promise you. Jesus asked him, truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Or as our kids might say in this millennium age, for real, you got to be kidding me. Folks, Jesus wasn't kidding then, and he ain't, and he ain't kidding now. 
The cross is serious business. We know from our studies that there were two criminals hanging on the cross, the separate crosses beside Jesus. Jesus was hanging there paying the penalty for our sins. And yet, after being mocked by soldiers, he said, if you are the king of Jews, save yourself and save us. And one of those hanging on the cross beside him hurled insults at him and said, aren't you the Messiah? Save us, save yourself and save us. Yet the other criminal rebuked him saying, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Jesus answered him and said, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Notice, notice Jesus did not say a word to those who mocked him. He held his peace, showing his immense patience and unmerited grace. In the minds of the criminals, we find contrasting attitudes. One was bitter, none repented. And the one was humble, repented. Key words I want to elaborate on are truly, today, with me, and paradise. Truly, for real, legitimately, absolutely. Stake your life on it. I'm not kidding you. I'm a promise keeper. I don't lie. You have my word on it. I promise you, today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year. You don't have to wait until I come back. This day you will be with me, I promise you. He promised him more than he asked for and sooner than he expected. With me. The Abba, the God, who is my daddy, the father of fathers, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the El Shaddai, the almighty God, Elohim, the creator God, the Holy One, the lily in the field, the bright and morning star, the peacemaker, the mighty battle axe, Yahweh, the God who is always there, the omnipresent one, present everywhere at the same time God, the uh, omniscient one, all-knowing God, all, the omnipotent one, all-powerful God, the king of kings, the one who gives living water springing up to eternal life. In paradise, better than Eden, better than a land flowing with milk and honey, streets of gold, the place where the light never goes out. He will be with the Father for, forever. And as believers, we will be with God forever. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. This is the cross is serious business. Praise the Lord. This next saying of Jesus on the cross comes from the book of John, the 19th chapter, uh, verses 26 and 27. And it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her into his own home. This particular saying of Jesus on the cross seems to be out of place. It's not, it's not a part of prophecy, uh, does not seem that it is a part of the fulfillment of prophecy. But he seems to have taken something that is out of order and paused for a few minutes. Uh, he paused midstream of an agony that he was going through, being antagonized, dying on a cross for my sins and for your sins. And he pauses for a moment because he is the firstborn and his earth father by now is 
passed away and he has a responsibility to take care of his mom. And in the midst of all of that, the scripture tells us that he looks into the crowd and he sees his mom. And he takes the time out to be concerned about what house she will be in when he leaves. Uh, after he is crucified, what would happen to his mama? And that's just like Jesus. He is the kind of an individual who never let his uh, divinity uh, get in the way of his humanity. He took the time to uh, ask the question about how and where what, what would happen to his mama. And I can tell you, this is not normal because he went to the cross for our sins to die and all of a sudden now he is concerned about something human related. Uh, Jesus was the person that uh, never did anything for any, uh, for no nonsense. He always uh, had something to say and he never wasted words. Uh, the fact that he took the time out to ask that question tells us he was making provisions for us beyond the provision of our sin going to the cross in our stead. Now I'm certain that scripture will bear me out that Jesus himself and his mom, they had the best of times and, and the worst of times. But when he stops to take the time to say to John, uh, here, behold your mom and behold your son, uh, he dropped the border and the boundaries from where uh, the line of family began and end. We always say blood is thicker than water, but we find here that he's showing us that love is just as great as blood. So we have to understand that during these times that we're in right now, it may seem that Jesus has, 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 has forgotten about us, but he's looking and he's seeing, and he's got the whole world in his hands. And don't forget, while we're being spiritual, let's not forget to show our human side, that we are his hands and we are his mouthpiece. And during this time, we ought to uh, look for those individuals in our lives who have had our back. Because after all, Mary had his back. She was there when he had to go hide out from Herod. She was there when he got lost and left in the temple. And the fact of the matter is, is that we ought to be looking for somebody who's been there for us at this time, maybe a teacher, or maybe a neighbor, or a friend, or a ride or die, a sibling. And we ought to pause from our spirituality for just a moment and give them some hope. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we ought to know that who holds tomorrow. So take this time from social distancing. Be reminded that home is where the heart is. You know where home is. It's where we learn how to talk, learn how to walk, where we had great meals and great talk, where we, explain, where we experienced discipline and laughter, where we cried and smiled, where we loved, lo had loved ones born and died where we experience the best and the worst of times. And isn't it ironic that we are now remembering Jesus at his rough and worst and toughest time. And this time that we're going through is not even to be compared to that of Jesus. But this is our dark hour. And so when times are tough, feel like we have lost our strength and we can't go on, we look to you. We look to him because he's the author and finisher our, of our faith. Look to the hills from which come at your help. It comes from the Lord. Be blessed. Good evening, Hope Nation. I'll be coming from Matthew 27 and 46. But before I do that, I want to take this opportunity to thank the pastor and first lady for giving me this opportunity and say, be encouraged out there, Hope Nation. God is good, his mercy and good forever. The scripture that I have to deal with is Matthew 27 and 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama samathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? First thing I want to point out is that, and the thought I want to leave here with, is Jesus suffered temporarily for sickness on the cross to allow permanent relief from forsakenness. I want to say it again. Jesus suffered temporary for sickness on the cross to allow our permanent relief from forsakenness. Now we have a choice. We can choose to be forsaken or we can choose not to be so. I want to go through a few technical aspects 
of this verse and then uh, talk about us and how we can deal with forsakenness. My God, my God is the first and only time that you see Jesus re relate to God in this fashion. Uh, in all other places in the gospel, he referred to my father or father. So why the difference here? Why my God, my God? It has to do with this idea of forsakenness, and he was forsaken. And it has to do with relationship and fellowship. The relationship of father and son existed from millennium to millennium. Rel the fellowship also existed from millennium to millennium, but for, it was halted for a period of time, during the time he was on the cross. And why was it halted? The fellowship was halted because Jesus bore the sins of every one of us throughout worldwide. And during that time, because God could not experience or could, could not entertain sin in his presence, there had to be some sacrifice to atone for this. And during the time that Jesus was atoning for this reconciliation for the whole world, the fellowship was broken between him and God. But Jesus passed his test. He did not let forsakenness defeat his purpose. He completed his purpose on the cross. So what does that mean for you and me? Let's look at a couple of scriptures that deal with this concept of forsakenness. First of all, let's, let's look at what David said. David said in, 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 in Psalms 27:10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then God will take care of me. Let's look at what Paul said in the New Testament. Paul said, in my first defense, no man stood with me. All forsook me. But the Lord stood by me and, and strengthened me. So man or woman will forsake you. But God said in his word, I will never leave you or forsake you. Paul also said in his word that I was troubled on every side, but not distressed. Confused, but not in despair. Cast down, but not destroyed. Persecuted, but not forsaken. So then what does that mean for you and me? Maybe you're out there or here, and you may feel forsaken for some reason. You might be forsaken by family, as, as David was, a husband, a, a wife, a spouse, uh, a child, or whatever the case may be. Or you might be in Paul's position. You might be feel forsaken by uh, a church member, an associate, like Paul was felt forsaken. But Paul, Paul said, the God stood by me and strengthened me. You might be forsaken in your job. You might be out of a job right now. You might be a feel for all it could do. But let me leave you with this thought. God again said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He said this in, in, in several different places in the scripture. God will take care of you. Always. On every day. And I, that reminds me of a thought that I used to say when I, when I was a kid. When I was growing up. Uh, God would take care of us all the way, uh, all through the day. And when I was playing with my kids, when I was growing up in, in Louisiana, uh, we, when we got finished playing during the day, uh, we would get ready to go home. And so one of us would say, either at my house or at his house, uh, I'll go peace away with you. Not, not peace of the way, but peace away. But God never goes peace away with you. God is with you always. God will take care of you. So keep that thought in mind. God will take you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank First Lady and also Pastor Eastland for giving me a chance to share God's word. I'll be coming from John 1928, New Living Translation. Jesus knew that everything was finished, and to fulfill scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. Now, if we have to do a title or a hashtag, it'll be, There's More to Do. There's More to Do. And looking at the scripture, we find we have to know what happened previously to understand why he knew everything was finished. The penalty of crucifixion was a painful death. Often the victims of this process were given a vinegar or a sour wine mixture to numb the pain. The first time Christ was offered this mixture, he refused it. Why? There was still something else to do. 
Now, before we go through the full process of crucifixion, please note, blood is cleansing. His blood is cleansing. And you know you have a part to play in this. I'm full aware that we're on Facebook live streaming, but do understand, if I'm pointing at you, you are to write or type or say, there's more to do. The process was, Christ was taken, found guilty for something that wasn't true, then sentenced. With Christ being found guilty of what he didn't do, this part covers false accusations that Satan makes against us to the Father. Soldiers beat Christ. They made mockery of him. His beatings caused internal bleeding. Christ's internal bleedings cover our internal sins. You know, the ones that you think nobody knows about. Nobody sees. It's our little secret. But he covered those sins. So you know what? There's more to do. When they whipped him with the cat of nine tails, that precious blood of Christ poured out to cover our external sins, the sins that we do against each other, the sins that we do that don't line up with the word of God. <laughs> but wait, there's more to do. He carried the cross which held our issues, all of our shoulda, woulda, couldas, but needless to say, he did that for us. As they nailed our Lord to the cross, they nailed our failings, they nailed our sins, and they nailed all of our iniquities. The original language, it states, it said he died the deaths. That's plural. And it means the death we all should have died, Christ stood in our place. But still, there's something else to do. Toward the end of this crucifixion, Christ stopped. In the process of dying, he had to take care of his mother. I know you heard this earlier, saying, son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. This means we're to take care of each other. Our elders, those who are at risk, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, stay six feet away. But <laughs> if you have an extra roll of paper towel or tissue, which is like gold right about now, leave it on their porch, ring their doorbell, go down to their driveway, and wave them. So do understand, after Christ made sure his mother was taken care of, he saw all was completed. Then he said, I'm thirsty. And he said this to fulfill the scripture. So remember, there's something else to do. Make sure you do it. Praise God. Glory to God. Good evening. My task is out of John 19, get to verse 29 and 30. A vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hip sock, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. If I was at the cross at that time and heard these words, my reaction would be, what's finished? A crowd around and looking up at him and some saying, well, you're dying. Yeah, you finished, all right. But Christ, in a sense, was trying to tell the world that there's more to my death than you realize. In the Greek, that word finish is telestop, which means paid in full. Jesus was saying to all and to us that what I am doing is paying every debt that you and I may owe and it's being paid in full. I would like for us to use what the old preachers say in your Holy Ghost imagination. Jesus, some days after the resurrection, took the 12 disciples, took the 11 disciples back to Calvary. 
And imagine with me as he stood at the foot of Calvary at the cross that crucified him, he looked up at the cross and told his disciples, it is finished. And in a sense, he said to them that when my father saw my blood on the cross, he removed the power of death. And when he saw my blood on the cross, he removed the sting of sin. It's finished. Christ said, I paid it all. And as he stood at the foot of the cross with his disciples, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I was dead, but now I am alive, a living witness to what God can do for you. It's finished. I paid the debt. You owe me nothing. You owe God nothing. You owe no one anything. Jesus said, I paid it all. The sins of yesterday have no power over you. You are free from the fear of death, the free from the fear of any pain. Death has no dominion over your life. It's finished. It's done. It's done. So the message I have for us on this evening is that whatever you're going through, whatever you need for remedy in your life to work to get and make you whole, it's done. Jesus has paid it all. There is no dominion over you in your life. As Christ looked up at the cross as what held him, he wanted to tell his disciples that that blood you see on the cross would never lose its power. It is done. It is finished. It is finished. God bless you. Amen. I'll be reading the seventh word from Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. I once found myself driving through the mountains of West Virginia. Why I was there is a story for another time. As I was driving around the mountain, it began to snow. You see, this isn't a good thing because driving on fresh snow is really slick. And as you're driving around the mountain, the speed limit is constantly changing in order to keep you safe from 45 to 20 to 30 to 15. And you never know what it's going to be until you go around the next corner. I literally thought at times I could crash because I couldn't put on my brakes uh, when I needed to slow down because I was driving on fresh snow and I thought I could slide off. And so I was scared and as I drove, my stomach was in knots and I just felt completely helpless. Throughout this pandemic experience, I felt the same feelings of helpless, helplessness and uneasiness that I know many of you have probably felt as well. The, uneasy, the uneasiness of not knowing what will happen next. Every day is different. What will the press conference say today? What do the numbers say today? All of this made me think of the isolation and loneliness that Jesus may have felt on the cross. His closest friends betrayed him. He knew the moment would happen, but it was still hard. He still suffered and he still felt pain. I wonder what Mary and the other disciples felt. I wonder what they were experiencing as they witnessed the moments leading up to these events. Probably fear, grief, sadness. I can't compare the crucifixion to what we're going through today, but I can say that God truly understands. And even though we felt alone at times, God has never left us. So if anyone understands, and it's God who understands what the present day feels like. We've all lost something to this point. Our plans have been altered. We're just taking it day by day, trying to figure out our next move. As we're trying to figure out our next move, we know one thing for certain is that God has never, ever, ever left us. As I was studying the scripture in Luke 23, 46, it led me to Psalm 31, where it says, In you, Lord, I will never be put to shame, because you are my rock and my refuge and my fortress. Deliver me in your righteousness. The text says, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Be the rock of my refuge. Refuge meaning we are safe. We are safe in his arms. We are safe because what is happening now is happening for the glory of the Lord. The reason I told the story about the mountain earlier is because it, it reminded me of this story, the time where I needed God to be my greatest refuge. And as I was driving around this mountain, 
um, this song, you know, back in the day, you used to burn CDs and put all kind of all kind of songs on on your CDs. And this song kept playing over and over again. And the lyrics were, "You will be safe in His arms, because the hands that hold the world are holding your heart." This is the promise He made. He will be with you always. And I don't know why, but that song kept playing over and over again. And once I realized it was playing, I knew that God was speaking to me in that moment. It was telling me, "Ivor, you will be safe in His arms, just as He is today." We are safe in his arms. The text in Psalm also says, I will rejoice, rejoice in your love because you have not given me over to my enemy, but you have set my feet in a spacious place. There was nothing but love when Jesus committed his spirit. Before Jesus committed his spirit, there were moments of darkness and there was a time where the sun didn't shine. But God, but God, Think of what, is hap what happened in darkness. In darkness, God is preparing us strategically for light. In the darkness, the veil was torn and God opened up the windows of heaven. Immediately after the death of Jesus, people were praising God. Imagine that. Imagine that. People were praising God immediately after his death. The Lord right now in the midst of chaos, he is healing our land. We're seeing things happen that we haven't seen happen in years. We're seeing fog being lifted. We're seeing dolphins swimming in muddied waters. We're seeing the Lord restore our families. And through it all, the Lord has remained sovereign. Sovereign meaning that he has all things under control, just as he did when he was on the cross. Those who witnessed what were happening did not understand why it had to happen that way. Those who witnessed mourned for their loss. Those who witnessed were angry. Some stood at a distance too, in too much fear to get closer. Others who witnessed doubted and they thought it was the end. But the blood of Jesus, one thing that we know is that his blood still works. For the people of God, his blood still works. In the midst of chaos, his blood still works. And I believe when he cried out with a loud voice, he did that with all power and with all authority. Because of his sacrifice, because of the servant heart of Jesus, in his hands we will always remain. Because of his love for us, we can seek refuge in him. He is the rock of our salvation. So rejoice and know that God is still sovereign. And because we are his people, our feet will always remain on solid ground. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I pray that you have been blessed and are encouraged by the seven last words that have been presented here on tonight. As we end tonight's service, we end in darkness, but we will see you on Sunday morning, sunrise service, 6 a.m., Facebook Live, YouTube, as we celebrate our risen Savior. Let us go in peace. We will see you Sunday, 6 a.m., Facebook Live and YouTube. God bless.